Welcome to the Micah Wizards Podcast's Deep Dives. Hi, everybody. For our first episode of this podcast, we're going to be talking all things fruit rooms. We'll go through the X's and O's of how to design a fruit room, how to maintain it, how to operate it on a daily basis. Especially when you have a dog around. Yeah. She helps. We Uh, have since giving up fruiting mushrooms altogether because Captain Stem is merely a block producer and a spawn producer and equipment producer. But we have a diverse knowledge from a lot of different farms around the world and the country, how they operate, how their fruiting rooms operate, and how we suggest they operate. And the basis for the general fruit room designs are what we're going to go through today. And Eric's worked with farms for years now, helping them set up, helping them upgrade, seeing stuff on the ground. I've seen a bit, but not as much, so I'm going to be sort of the curious acolyte spitting questions out and eric as the sage fruiting elder shall shine the light of wonderful mushrooms upon the world yes sir so what we're going to start with first is just structure concepts about structure talking about materials the actual design of the room itself lighting all those x's and o's Yeah, one of the things that comes to mind when a lot of people ask us questions about structures and fruiting is uh, if they're building from the ground up, if they're coming from the standpoint of uh, having a pre-existing space, or if they're trying to sort of imagine working within the confines of a garage or a basement or a facility at large, without a doubt, you're gonna run across something that you don't have the ability to do here, whether it's drainage, whether it's a certain amount of electrical, blah, blah, blah. Right. There's a lot of things that I think go into the building of a fruit room, so structure sort of first. Um, The general footprint for a farm that we suggest is about 12 feet by 24 feet. This is to scale, no it's not. (laughs) <laughs> I'm that good. He went to art school, everybody. Got an arts, art, yeah, shit, yeah. I feel like an artist. Uh, so we have this 12 by 24 room, and the 12 by 24 room has the ability to produce, if properly sort of managed, she really wants your attention. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you go. Like, oh. like, why didn't you just start drawing naked people? Yeah, why don't you just lay down? Just one paw and then the other. Just one paw and the, oh god, there it goes. Okay, so a twelve by twenty-four foot room gives you the ability to fruit approximately, um, let's call it between five and six hundred pounds per week, and doing that in there, and and that's like full capacity. Like mm-hmm. you can't really fruit more than that. You could chalk this full, but it wouldn't be a rolling amount. Yeah. So you could probably fit you know an epic amount of racks in here, and. Uh, but it would be all out of balance, right? Yeah. Too, too dense. Too dense, too yeah. dense. So this room in general is comprised on the outside, hopefully, of uh, steel studs. Um, steel framing and studs really help just, you know, keep everything light, replaceable, movable, and cleanable. And if there were wood studs, for instance, you'd run into issues of water sort of wicking and running up from the bottom of the fruit room where it will accumulate from your humidity and actually suck into the wood and you know form mold blooms and all sorts of stuff yeah i've actually seen that in fruit rooms uh where that were initially constructed out of wood and after a number of years it becomes such a yeah such a vector that you have to you gotta you gotta gut it yeah goodbye for your rooms (laughs) yeah and that's to be said like for anything you know you're you're trying to create an insular fruit room and whether or not this is in a bigger space like a barn or whatever it is that fruiting room in general you want to sort of protect from the outside um, a little bit but more than anything you want to protect the outside of your structure <laughs> from a fruiting right. room yeah you are creating a gnarly super yeah. dirty environment it's yes. disgusting without a doubt so steel studs are super important um can you do hemlock can you do other things sure um but that's definitely what we advise uh coroplast is the cheapest and more simple thing to build things out of and 
Coreplast comes in four by eight sheets and you can line it and uh, um, sort of fit it within the confines of like a, a two foot on center stud sort of design. And the sheets probably weigh like two pounds, you know. If that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're super, it super takes two light. seconds to zip together. Yep. And uh, you can get little stainless steel screws, self tappers, or anything to go into the studs. That core plast in general um, is about between eight and eleven dollars a sheet, and you know eight and eleven bucks is in the world of COVID now, especially that's pretty fucking cheap. Mm. <laughs> so uh, you know if you want to use other things like FRP or uh, any other sort of plastic materials, the issue becomes that they're heavy, they're hard to install. A lot of general contractors, if you're going to try to get somebody to actually do this for you uh, or with you, they'll they'll want to put like backing and wood and all sorts of shit on it. And the thing to keep in mind if you're not going to build this yourself is to just say no <laughs> a lot. Um, the other side to this structure is this fantastic 3M flashing tape. <laughs> and all this stuff, we'll sort of like, you know, share links and, and whatnot when these uh, sort of get published. So... 3M flashing tape is like a, a self-healing, um, it's like a almost a rubbery material. Yeah, latexy. Yeah, it's stretchy. It's ridiculously strong once yeah. it's ad adhered. Yeah, I mean, this is the same structure, for instance, that we'll talk about in a later episode of like uh, lab production. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, lab construction, because it's the same sort of stuff. Yeah. Yep. She really, yeah. really, it's oh, like, yeah. you yeah. smell something. Um, her ball winch. Something. Yeah, exactly. This is Edna Krabappel, by the way. Anyways. Uh, HR department. These three things in particular should be the basis for any of your construction. Um, and without going into crazy detail about it, they're the best sort of most malleable stuff that you can repurpose. Uh, if you smash through a piece of core plast, you can just replace it. Core plast, you can get at any sign shop. Uh, large sign companies will send you pallets of it for probably even cheaper than eight bucks. 3M flashing tape is at most lumber yards, not necessarily hardware stores, but lumber specific. And then steel studs, well, I don't know, Google that shit. So that's the basis. Core plast is very easy to clean. Oh yeah. It's helpful. It is super easy to clean. And it can get dirty and it's fluted. So right. by all means, it can sort of trap water and, and have minor amounts of probably mold or shit growing on it but yeah but you know nothing's going to want to grow mold's not going to want to grow on it to the same extent that you would if you had some sort of more organic substance yeah lying sure. your walls yeah and that's something to consider is the fact that you know no matter what you build out of these uh sort of fruiting room setups you're gonna have to replace shit there's no like i just want it up and done and it's there forever you're gonna have to tear it down and build it again <laughs> that's the reality of it yeah so that's the structure at large. And without going further into the structure in general, one thing that we should consider is the elementary sort of construction purposes. So there's many different things to consider, but if you're building from scratch, the number one thing you wanna kind of concern yourself with is drainage. Um, I don't know, did, did Cascadia have drains in there? Uh, yeah, yep, yeah. they had some classic floor drains, yep. Yeah. So drainage in particular becomes this, um, it's a double-edged sword. You definitely want a P-trap <clears throat> or trap somehow the water as it goes out. And for people who don't know what a P-trap is, it's essentially just like a trap like this. And what happens is water gets trapped in this area right here so that air gets locked and you can't have air coming from outside sewage or whatever back into your fruiting room. And only when water is forced in will it force water out. But as soon as it's done forcing water out, water stays there and it traps the vapors that would be in the drainage system. Simple enough. Um, and for someone who just didn't get that, what's the importance of that? Yeah, well, you know, contamination is everything. and. You don't really know where your drains are going unless you know where your drains are going. So <laughs> something to consider in all that is the fact that whatever that drainage is, is coming into, whether it's like 
are going to, whether it's a septic system, whether it's, um, you know, sewer, whatever it is, you don't want those contaminants coming back up in your room, causing bacterial blotch or just rank smells or anything like that. Traditionally, you know, open the fucking drawers under your sink and you'll see a pee trap coming out from your sink. And that's why your sink doesn't smell like a dead dog. <laughs> so a pee trap is excellent, but at the same time, if you want to, you can cut a channel and you can even have this concrete pad, if you will, sloped towards that channel if you are, you know, in new construction. And that channel merely has to be like, you know, maybe six inches, you know, cut into the uh, concrete surface. Depends upon how big your foundation is, if it's foam, what it is. It's not essential, um, but it does help water from sort of accumulating. And no matter the missing system, and we'll go into that later, you really can't get around it. Yeah, and if you're trying to scrub the hell out of your room as well, super helpful just to make that go faster. Yeah, it's totally true. Um, so that's structure, that's drainage. The only thing that I really add to that is most fruit rooms don't require a hell of a lot of electricity. And I think uh, one of the more important things to consider is that um, that means electricity, by the way. <laughs> electricity. Uh, <laughs> if, if you have, you know, regular 120 service or 110 service or whatever, 115, I don't know what the fucking difference to any of this shit is. Uh, I'm not an electrician. Don't count on me to make your fruit room function. The only thing that you might consider in a fruit room like this is if A, if you have a sump pump, which could be another solution, is if you dig like a large sort of circular area out of your concrete pad, pour concrete in, this would go down like maybe 16 inches and have a sump pump. So you could basically like, you know, mop all of your extra moisture while you're cleaning your fruit rooms, you know, so on and so forth into that space. Another little tidbit of whatever is most people don't think you have to clean your fruiting rooms as much as you do. You do, like yeah. daily, if you can. No, I like as a reference to the other end of the spectrum of big scale mushroom cultivation. I yeah. was reading that after every single, at my copia, mm -hmm. they fruit these massive batches and a whole room's dedicated toward. And as soon as that crop's done, the entire room gets like completely cleaned from head to toe. Yeah. And just, and granted their standards are they have a lot more liability on their hands, but it just goes to show that a company like that's doing it, despite all their automation, then you probably should too. Yeah, and you're talking like cleaning, you wanna swap cleaning agents around, but you know, around 250 PPMs of bleach, I guess. And, uh, oh yeah, that's how you spell it, Nirvana. And, um, you know, spray the surfaces, be able to power wash, or uh, um, at least just spray down your walls, clean them, rag them, whatever. And then all that water, that sort of residual, just gets pushed in. Electric, yeah, you're talking like not a ton of electricity. You're running lights, you're running some pumps maybe, and maybe a compressor out here if you have a high pressure misting system. Mm -hmm. And once again, we'll get into all that shenanigans. Later. Yeah, this is so satisfying. You just feel like, this is like that drawing went away. <laughs> <laughs> so that's structure. Oh, bam. The next thing, that uh can you pronounce that is that a uh, phlegm phlegm no i plenum. believe that's plenum plenum it's the plenum of air the thing that a lot of early farms don't really have to think that much about especially when they're considering um you know the fact that they have like a closet with no drainage and they're fruiting in a martha or whatever it is mm -hmm. uh, it, it's that when you scale up to the size the air exchanges that have to occur because of how much the CO2 builds up in a fruiting room um, and how much the air has to be sort of evacuated from that fruiting room because of the high CO2. Um, it really gets you to this point where you need to condition the air coming into your fruiting room. So ideal temperatures for this like 12 by 24 space or any fruit room for that matter sure. is going to be about 55 to 65 Fahrenheit. Um, some species can go higher, some go lower. What goes the lowest? Uh, Neverdini, Anoki. Oh, um, right, Anoki. Some of those, odd, there's walking. oddballs that go in either direction, but as far as your bread and butter stuff that most of you are going to focus on growing, talking shiitakes, oysters, lion's mane, etc. Yeah. 
this is this is the typical range that you want to stick between. Yeah, and if you're trying to supply producers who need their fucking mushrooms on time, you have to know that 55 to 65, even with that large of a differential of 10 degrees, it will speed up or slow down your production significantly. So if somebody mm-hmm. from, you know, good old produce company calls up and you're like, give me my mushrooms. And you're like, yeah. it's going to be five more days because I'm at 65 instead of 55 or 55 instead of 65. Yeah. They're gonna, they don't give a shit. So. Yeah, I feel like <laughs> over the course of these episodes, this is going to come up a million times. And I'm going to sound like such a nerd, but this yeah. is a, one of a million examples in mushroom farming where something's a log curve. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, 55 is radically slower than 65 it's it's not even close and yeah uh but on the other hand you get denser tissue and you can you can get you know in some respects higher quality um if you phase it out correctly whereas if you're going for speed yeah uh going to that upper bound is is key yeah and i I should say like contamination things Mm. might get slower at 55 but contamination will drop so and you're going to end up with these like you know realizations over time in a space but i digress this turns me towards plenum you can't actively condition a fruiting room with a traditional hvac system and you know having a heating and cooling system would be really great but the the problem with um, heating and cooling systems is they recirculate air and the reason you can't just recirculate air within a room hi sweetheart is the spore load, the humidity, all of the things that sort of go into the control aspect of trying to regulate temperature, humidity, and CO2 within a really caustic environment. I mean, most of you should know this by now, and if you don't, I'm coming for you. But like, as good as I can draw a mushroom, right? A mushroom produces about, what is it, a billion spores a piece? Is it a billion? It's a lot. It's a lot. It's, a, it's in the gazillions. And all those spores that come out of each and every cap and say there's like, you know, 100 shiitakes on one 10-pound log, you have 100 billion spores possibly, this HVAC system will get clogged up so fucking fast that you will never end up having any efficiency. And that $30,000 HVAC unit you just put in there, well, it'll be dead within a month. Yeah, and that same logic applies when once in a while you'll hear people talking about... uh, Trying to HIPAA filtrate and yeah, all these deals. Like this equipment is not up to the task. Yeah, we're not trying to like uh, shit on anybody in particular who might have written two books in particular about certain mushroom cultivation techniques in particular. But don't put HVAC in your room and don't worry about pre-filtering a, a sort of setup like this. We're going to go into a lot of different things down the road of how you can save energy. But the thing you have to keep in mind is the fact that... Um, energy at large in a mushroom facility is just it's near impossible to chase so if you're trying to sort of keep this 55 to 65 degree temperature <clears throat> you need a plenum i think this is how you spell plenum man. yeah i know you're right i went to art school i don't fucking know that's why he's not drawing you want to try to draw something oh no oh <laughs> shit yeah. all right fine we'll get censored <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> we'll get censored So a plenum is essentially a room in which you're not fruiting in. And this fruiting air doesn't come back to this room. And a lot of farms will start this way. Your plenum could be an auxiliary room. It doesn't have to be a particular size, but the amount of cooling and or or heating that has to happen in this room has to be able to keep up with the number of air exchanges that pull from the plenum and force all of the dirty air outside without much of a return system yeah i can't draw it up offhand i don't know if you can but there are like concrete ways you can try to calculate that to be approximately correct yeah there's a number of things that you can figure out um but what it usually comes down to is an hvac specialist coming to your house going like oh yeah we can give you you know x amount of uh, air exchanges with this particular system and so on and so forth but the cost you know goes up with every air exchange and the size of this system in the middle of texas in the middle of summer turns into like a hundred thousand dollar ac oh, yeah. <laughs> so so the examples we're going to give are, are minor but you know this plenum could be a room this plenum could also be the space in which you're pulling from right. which is like let's say it's your house and this is the basement Or let's say this is a barn and that's your fruiting room. Scale sort of doesn't matter. 
the point is you want to condition the space inside of the plenum. And if you condition that space to the degree at which you want inside of the fruiting room, there are ways to tweak that, you know, going into the fruiting room. But for lack of going into crazy, crazy, you know, uh, tangents here, this air should be somewhere close to the air in which you want your fruiting room to be at. So that way, when you're pulling this air into your fruiting room, um, you end up with the right proper degree. Considering this is one of the biggest things that you have to consider. Um, let's just give a brief example of like what a lot of people were doing maybe 10 years ago and mm -hmm. still are, mm -hmm. shipping containers. So if you have a shipping container <clears throat> and, you know, let's call it 40 feet because you're rich as fuck from your weed game back in the day and you were like up in Murder Mountain and you're like getting 5,000 bucks a pound and like, now I'm just sad. Um, getting shot at. You're getting shot at, getting chased down hills. <laughs> I love that story. It's so sad. Uh, true story. You can build a plenum into your shipping container. So this space in particular can be something of a uh, small space, especially because the cubic space in which you're going to be fruiting in doesn't necessarily have to have that many air exchanges if you don't pack it fucking chock full. So that's another thing to consider in all this stuff is we really don't have to pack rooms full to make them efficient. The more CO2 buildup, the more humidity controls and temperature controls you have to have, the slower everything will get, the more sick a room will get with bacteria or mm -hmm. other things. So, you know, there's perfection in a lot of these systems. We'll work it out in time. But there's the shipping container set up. And there's the definition of a fucking plenum. Wow. What the hell we got next, dude? Now, we'd like you to illuminate the concepts of negative versus positive pressure. Would you care to get down? In you a don't want to be involved in this anymore? Go ahead. Get on, on out of here. Go throw a ball for yourself. All right. So next up, negative pressure, positive pressure. What's it all about, Eric? All right. So... Um, Generally speaking, uh, I don't know where negative and positive pressure came from. Is that like a, it must have been like a Stamets-y thing. No. You mean in, in specifically in this context? Just those terms, because like, I've never heard over pressure until, uh, until I think you came here from my Belgium. Uh, I don't know if that's a translation thing. I don't know what but it is. Yeah. Negative and positive, uh, it was a standard concept, I mean, from... Uh, you know, facility design outside of the mushroom world, you know, things have been positively pressured way before anyone was growing mushrooms, you know? Yeah, I guess it has. In this, in this kind of context. I'm putting you in a room. A uh, bit of advice, if you smoke weed every morning, don't try to run with your dog. <laughs> <gasps> Anyways. Okay, positive and negative pressure. What it comes down to is when you have a space, let's call it any space and you take air from outside of that space with a fan, that's a fan, and you force air from another space into a closed space, you end up going into a time zone warp and you die. No, um, basically you're building up positive pressure in here. So this room, you'll see like the walls will bow out, you know, and it'll follow the path of least resistance. If this is a super, you know, like, well sealed room <laughs> it would find its way out via probably slowing down this fan and then creating a slower like resistance on the fan which is not good if this were a shitty room and it wasn't put together quite well you'd have like you know air escaping through all the cracks so let's pretend that this is your fruiting room if you create positive pressure in a fruiting room and you have your phenom I think we should say everything in a Belgian accent, even though I don't really know what a Belgian accent is. Uh, it's pronounced mayonnaise. <laughs> Duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> I really like mayonnaise. I was uh, a Casper. Ah, uh, I like saying hi to a person I've never met. What's up, dude? Uh, He's listening. Yeah, yeah, I bet he is. Yeah. I bet he gives a shit. <laughs> For the price of one mayonnaise. <laughs> You too can get access to right, We have bullshit. our fanny packs. <laughs> our little mayonnaise packets. Ah, dude, I love fanny packs. Anyways, if you create positive pressure within a fruit room like this, and it forces air out into your plenum, 
what is that doing? It's spiking CO2 and it's spiking the level of spores and uh, and humid shit air. Sludge. Humid sludge. Shit. Balls. Air. That makes sense. Mm, I get it now. Into that, yeah, <laughs> that tied it together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're putting the uh, the sort of plenum in jeopardy, you can't accurately use the plenum air to condition the room because your CO2 will leak out and spike. And you're creating the same problem as yeah. an HVAC system would exactly, present. Exactly. Exactly. So you can't really do that. So what really helps in this time warp is if we get rid of this. And we get rid of the fan real fast here. Then we just assume that in this fruit room, we have a negative pressure system, which is a fan inside or just outside of the room. And it's pulling air from this room outside of the plenum, outside into outside land. Basically, all of the dirty, CO2-rich, spore-ridden air gets hucked out of the fruit room and not back into your plenum. And there's a number of ways to do it, um, but this would be a uh, sort of an example of negative pressure. So to briefly draw these two things up with, no, I'm just joking, uh, with, <laughs> with just two squares. So we have positive. And we have negative. In this case, negative is good. We have air coming in and being forced back out, which would be positive pressure. And then we have an air inlet, but air being pulled out of that room, and that creates negative pressure. The restriction here and the ability to pull from a plenum comes from this instrument right there. So inside of that fruiting room, you have all of this air that is basically being pulled from the fruiting room, but the makeup air has to come from somewhere else. So that's what this is. It's basically a duct with a damper on it. So when negative pressure builds up in this room, you don't want your balls to implode and turn your fucking room into a goddamn mirror factory. So you essentially, is that fair? Yes. <laughs> it's got nothing to do with anything. <laughs> You're basically, you just don't want your walls to implode, but you want to be able to take the spores and the CO2, and I'm sure we're just beating a fucking dead horse here, out of the fruit room and out of your plenum. So this does a number of things, but it becomes super important with the topics we'll go down after. Yeah. So, yeah. We'll get into air pressure in a lot of these episodes yeah. and how it's applied depending on the application. Um, but one important like 30,000 foot view thing to keep in mind is we're always talking about relative air pressure levels here. Right. You don't have to think about objective. It's just when Eric is talking about a negatively pressurized fruit room, he just means the air pressure in there is lower than whatever your baseline atmospheric air pressure is wherever you live, which obviously depends on altitude and those sort of things. Yeah. Um, and the way you're going to be able to classify a room in your farm as positive or negative is just how it relates to the rest of the facility and the airflow plan for the whole facility. Yeah. And we can get into the metrics for how to check all that and stuff uh, at a later date. Yep, for sure. Yeah, and it's safe to say that if you're creating negative pressure inside of your fruiting room, um, you're winning. So let's just say your building is like this. Your fruit room's up against the back wall. You got your shrinum and you got your fruit room <laughs> and you're actively pulling air out with a fan and you have a damper to allow makeup air in from your plenum. You've created a negative pressure fruit room. Prez, FR. I feel like these are, I don't know what they are, but you get the point. And I know Eric is always talking about this, and it'll come up all the time when he's doing a consult about fruiting and facility design with farms. There's always the temptation to try to always be recirculating your air and be max efficiency with this all, but um, most of the time it seems that the only way to make a fruit room rock solid is it's just a one-way airflow. Yeah. Just as he described right there. Yeah, there's one exception to that, which we'll get into, and uh, I'll push the creator to develop more of these things. You know who you are. 
So that's negative and positive pressure. What's we got next? What's happening now? Now we'd like to talk about some environmentals, some, some variables here, temp, CO2, and humidity. We kind of talked about temp a little bit. Um, once again, I'm gonna bring back this traditional uh, example and um, I can explain a little bit how this can all sort of be um, applicable in a lot of different ways, specifically with ducting. But if we say your plenum is uh, the majority of a barn, and you say your fruit room is a room within a barn, you're essentially controlling air with a temperature control unit that recirculates inside of your plenum and allows you to accurately and consistently keep this at the temperature appropriate for pulling into your fruiting room through a damper, negatively pressurized with a fan that blows outside. That's how you'd initially start to think about controlling temperature. This plenum doesn't have to be around your fruiting room. This plenum could be, uh, you know, if this is your house. Yeah, you live in this house. And your fruiting room is in the basement. And your attic, for some reason, has a bitch and AC in it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also got a chimney because it's an old fucking house. And it comes from, uh, you know, outer space or some shit. I don't know why I would have this, but it's defunct and your smokestack no longer matters, but you have some like nice fresh air leaking in there mm -hmm. and you have like a nice giant seven and a half ton AC unit up here. You just run a duct down your chimney and into your fruit room. Your plenum's up here, your fruit room's down there, your air negatively pressured pulls outside. So the plenum can be anywhere. It's just has to be whatever's direct ducted to your fruiting environment. Right. You just need a course of, you know, movement for conditioned air to get to that space. So let's assume you have a normal setup like a lot of people do where they have this existing building and they're trying to build a fruit room inside of it. So this works in a lot of different circumstances. Um, let's say once again, this is a 12 by 24 room. This plenum is somewhere in the same cubic air. So you could have a walk-in cooler out here, you could do a little harvesting, so on and so forth. Um, but you don't want to store blocks that are producing CO2 out here, and you don't want to have a ton of action happening. You want to make sure that this plenum is accurately uh, monitored for CO2, and it has the ability to pull fresh air in from outside. No matter what you're using to cool the plenum, whether it's like one uh, halcyon or, or mini split unit, um, or if it's a uh, reefer container, I'm sorry, not reefer containers, but reefer um, uh, evaporative coolers yeah. 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 with condensers outside, whatever it is, you just want to make sure that you can keep this room to the temperature that you want it. So a lot of people use mini splits and I think it's a smart way to go. They're cheap, you can install them yourself or you can find some crazy ass HVAC person who thinks they know everything to install them and usually fuck them up, but you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> there's always options. This sort of situation can account for fresh air. And without getting crazily uh, sort of uh, off topic, this is a CO2 meter that's wired to a fan it actually creates a little bit of negative pressure inside of your, or positive pressure inside of your room. You could also create negative pressure with this and suck CO2 outside, but if you're kind of trying to recirculate and add to this, it's better to create a minor amount of positive pressure in that space in order to sort of get the CO2 down. So air uh, temperature and CO2 are the two things that are hardest to regulate in these systems. Um, but generally speaking, you want your plenum CO2 to be lower than your fruit room CO2, or at least at its approximate, you know, low end. So let's say with, um, the most, you know, uh, blocks in a fruiting room, your CO2 will spike at something like, uh, 900 to a thousand parts per million. And parts per million are the most generic way to measure CO2. But you want your fruit room to be somewhere down around 450 to 500. You want to be able to bounce back and forth from this. This plenum has to be at 450 or below. If it's too high and you have CO2 building up inside of your plenum, 
and you're pulling air in there and negative really pressurizing this fruiting room pulling outside you'll never get it below the lowest that it's at in the plenum thus fresh air so the most efficient way for a system to sort of track and to um uh sort of keep a consistent energy base inside of a room is recirculation but without a doubt you're going to have doors opening and closing from the outside hopefully it'll keep your you know co2 relatively low but in the case that it doesn't all you do is install a fan which could be you know just something like 250 cfm small squirrel cage fan and that's essentially wired to a co2 meter so that squirrel cage fan which kind of looks like a weird uh, blow dryer thing, it sits on your wall, is wired and piggybacked directly to a CO2 meter. From CO2 meter, da, 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 dot com. Dot com. <laughs> they have a mushroom specific CO2 meter. It's something like 300 bucks. And what it does is regulate this fan so that it can modulate between parts per million counts. So say your you know co2 is creeping up in here for some reason maybe because you positive pressurize this room like a jackass and you're getting co2 leaking out here instead of outside then what you really want to do is essentially get a co2 meter to set so that it kicks this fan on until it brings the co2 inside of your plenum down to your 450 or below that way you can regulate the temperature as well as the co2 in this plenum this isn't something that's going to have the same level of air exchanges, you know, as everything else, especially your fruiting room, but it'll just allow you to make sure that you have a fail safe within your plenum. Um, that CO2 meter is the same one that you're going to use inside of your fruiting room. Does that make sense? Here? Oh, it all makes sense. I mean, okay. you know, a plenum room doesn't have nearly as much activity, in, you know, as far as what you as the farmer's doing and as far as the mushrooms growing. So these environmental variables aren't going to change nearly as much. And especially if the volume's large enough, it's it's not going to buffer quite, a, quite as uh, uh, slimly. Uh, so that's the basis for the controls of CO2 within your plenum. Simultaneously, you want the same level of CO2 control with inside of your fruiting room. So I'm not going to get crazy and draw your plenum. You know where your fucking plenum is. Or you don't. Figure it out. When we create a negatively pressurized fruiting room that pulls from your plenum and then actively exhausts to the outside, this thing is basically a fan that for a 12 by 24 uh, foot room should be at about 1,000 CFMs. Um, and I say that at the top end. You can get a lot of fans or you can get a lot of rheostats that actually control the temperature of these things. The temperature, the fan speed, and they'll modulate from like 400 to 1,000. So if your room is packed, you can really make sure that your you know CFMs are cranked fully up. And that fan is going to be hucking air outside only when it kicks on your little PPM meter. So that PPM meter is essentially just a screen and you control your uh, your sort of CO2 settings. For most species, you wanna keep it between 400 and 900. I think outside atmospheric is like just above 400. Would we die if it's below 400? I forget. Uh, I couldn't tell you. I think Bob Dole runs for president or something, I can't recall. But anyways, um, <laughs> your CO2 meter kicks the fan on and creates negative pressure pulling all the CO2 from this room outside and then it kicks off and it allows just passive sort of air to just circulate inside of your room. And then when the CO2 builds up again, it forces it outside. So this creates your sort of modulation effect. It allows you to gain some sort of efficiency to balance between 400 and a thousand, you know, parts per million or 400 and 900. Oh shit. Yeah. Parts per million or 400,000 CFMs. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of an interesting thing to compare the two, but ideally that size fan to regulate this many PPMs inside of that fruiting room of a 12 by 24 structure, that's sort of yep. your setup. And if you have that variable speed control, yep. you're giving yourself a range at which, how dense you can pack that fruit room, which will be handy. And here's a question. Yeah. How do you know if your CO2 meter is giving you proper readings? What are the ways you can tell? 
you can just go in there and if you like hang in there too long and like look in a corner <laughs> and you're just like uh you're spaced out bro and you're like i need to get a hamburger and then you get a hammer instead and you're gnawing on the hammer you're just describing yesterday morning oh yeah it's been a week dude it's been a week so um yeah that's every morning for me for the most part no, there's so many different ways to tell. Predominantly, it's like the smell in the room. Um, your senses are a huge indicator here. I will say right now that a lot of fucking like novel green, I'm super into mushrooms and can sense their shenanigans farmers mm. are like, I can feel when the CO2 is too high. And then I, I flip the switch. It's just, it doesn't operate that way. So if you're new agey and, and whatnot, get the fuck off of this fucking podcast. Cause like, you're not going to learn anything. You're not going to absorb it and you're not going to have any automation. Cause when you have five or six of these fruiting rooms and some fucking vacation time and no CO2 meter, you're going to be like, why did I come back? Your feels ain't helping. To my blocks of oysters looking like a goddamn bunch of goddamn cordyceps fruiting up from a goddamn block with yep. no caps. That's another way you can tell CO2. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so CO2 is the number one thing that you want to automate. If you're starting a fruit room, uh, you know, and expanding from like a Martha or a closet setup, get a CO2 meter. It's like $300 and it's the only way to regulate any of this stuff. Um, when it comes down to temperature controls and when it comes down to humidity controls, you can get away with a lot of elementary setups <clears throat> initially. But CO2 is something you really can't regulate unless you just have a fan running all the fucking time. And that's really not necessary because if you have a room that has two racks in it and you're like, just you got a, a mellow week and you got, you know, maybe a hundred pounds of something fruit in here and a hundred pounds of something fruit in here. And this thing is just running all the time. <laughs> you're just yeah, taking all your plenum air energy. and you're just flying and blasting it inside. Yep. Yeah, it's stupid. So regulate it with a CO2 meter from CO2meter.com. I swear they didn't. They're they're not a. We're, they're not a. Sponsor. They're not over in the corner of the <laughs> room watching us. Uh, um, so that's CO two. Uh, CO two is directly coupled with temperature in the sense that your plenum really has to be able to keep up with the level of air exchanges. Man, that was a bad squeak. And the air exchanges are going to be dictated by biological factor of what's growing in there. Exactly. So there's like a number of issues at play. When you're considering taking a fruit room to its max capacity and you're like, okay, we're going to shock this full, it's going to generate a ton of heat and generate a lot of CO2, which is something that is a struggle and a balance and a modulation that really you have to like take into effect when you're building a any structure within, you know, mushroom cultivation. Yeah, and we're planning on getting into this specific topic in depth, but just know that it's kind of a vicious cycle. Yeah. Those two things just feed each other in a in a positive feedback loop. So yeah. you gotta stay ahead of it. Higher temp, higher CO2 production, higher CO2 production, higher temperature. It just stair steps one another to the point at which uh And then other problems come bad. up, all kinds of weird problems come up. Yeah, yeah, it does. Um so you got temperature out here, you got temp or CO2 in there, and you have the regulation of this by a negative pressurized system. Um, that's a pretty basic breakdown of all of that. The next sort of setup and uh, um, consideration is uh, humidification. So humidification can be uh, anything from, you know, atomized pond floggers ducted in with no humidistat and just a you know cycle timer. Um, or they can be high pressure misting systems from heart, emv.com. Mm -hmm. We'll go into that one <clears throat> on a different episode that's like incredibly specific, but just for a general breakdown, what most people are going to end up getting is a um, hydrofogger, which is probably the simplest sort of uh, system out there. And what that thing is, a hydrofogger in general, is it's this like automatic sort of uh, humidification system. And what's kind of nice about it is that it does require some cleaning, but it has an automatic float valve. So your H2O comes into this float valve and fills up a little bit. And then this weird ass dome looking fucking space machine vibrates at a crazy rate 
atomizing fog and producing fog out of that water inside of this sort of like uh, plenum above the vibrating bubble. This forces humid air to basically rise up from that and go into your fruiting room. Um, so air and H2O come from here, vibration, humidification, right into your fruiting room. These hydrofoggers have been around in the cannabis industry for like, I don't know, ever, you know, and they're, they're really efficient. They're good. Uh, they produce a ton of humidity. There's a few different sizes of them, but it's worth just checking them out. I think it's hydrofogger.com. Um, there's no real difference between the biggest and the smallest ones, um, but they do operate really efficiently in small fruiting room setups. The thing to consider when you're going to sort of implement a system like this, which is very similar to where you might start, um, is, uh, you know, just a, a vat or a barrel of water, mm -hmm. a fan, a bunch of water, and then pond foggers. Those pond foggers are essentially atomizing and vibrating, creating humid plumes of air within this barrel. And then you have uh, air being forced in and then humid air being forced out into your fruiting room. In both of these scenarios, you want these units outside of your room. You don't want them inside of a fruiting room. And briefly to talk about that, I'm just going to draw it out. Because drawing is the way of the world. I was just saying if you're paying attention, if you fell asleep yet. <laughs> <laughs> if you put a pond fogger or a uh, humidification system like we just drew inside of a fruiting room, you're taking dirty air, you're humidifying it, and then you're throwing it out all over your crops. Um, especially if this is untreated water. The thing to consider is just taking that mushroom hydro fogger or you know giant barrel of that pond fogger system and putting it outside of your room where there's not a ton of caustic shit so let's say that this is a side view of your fruiting room your barrel sits out here hopefully you're smart enough to just like throw a float valve in here they're like really fucking cheap like really cheap on amazon like two dollars mm. that way it just automatically keeps filling this you could even get a cool peristaltic pump to be able to pump in X amount of, you know, um, bleach. You want to treat this water with like 150 to 250 parts per million of bleach. You can use CLO2. You can use a lot of different things, but. Yeah, and as far as this is concerned, too, it's, yeah, it's not like a stagnant pool, but it's not that far from it. And like you're already pointing out, it's constantly being injected with dirty air from the outside so this is the reason why it needs to be on the outside is it's not sterile yeah this turns into one of your biggest vectors of bacteria yeah uh, in a fruit room if you're not careful yeah this is the predominant thing that everybody calls us spooked out of their minds about like at least multiple times per week mm -hmm. and uh i have bacteria blotch i don't know how to deal with it this is how you deal with it you treat the water you filter the air coming into this just with, you know, a tiny replaceable filter. Does it can be like a one of those spongy earthmatic fucking air filters? Uh, just a coarse air filter. And then the humidification from outside of your room, inside of your semi-clean vat of water gets pumped in your fruiting room. It's as simple as that. Um, you can even put a fan right in front of this if you need to disperse the air uh, or humidity or whatever. Just keep that ultrasonic low pressure humidification system outside of your fruiting room at all costs and treat the water yeah and if you keep it treated and you keep it clean then all that's turning into humidity that's covering your mushrooms yep the other system and there's a couple of them out there aeromist is like the uh you know what you're walking down the street in arizona and you see this mini mall in the distance and you're almost dead on the sidewalk because it's like 150 fucking degrees outside but there's mist there's a mist along the sidewalks over there and it might be a mirage but you say fuck it so you spark yourself up a j bro and get a 40 ounce of schlitz and walk on over because you're a hobo in arizona and the mist is being produced from these water lines that are running along the sort of eaves of the walkways. And they're not really cooling you. They're just promoting this like, you know, it's like a mirage of cooling. You're mm -hmm. like, I, I, maybe I feel cooler. I don't know. It's hard it to tell. It gives you like a moment 
Yeah, yeah you're like close uh, enough on impact. Yeah. Yeah. So you just look like a freak on acid, fucking going like this in a mini mall, uh, and uh, that's called an, <laughs> that's called an aero mist system, and uh, it basically has a um, you know a compressor pump, and that compressor pump goes to a series of water lines that have little valves uh, or heads on them, little mister heads. And they atomize the air and water into your uh, fruiting room to a degree at which you have some control. The problem is the demand for that is a lot higher. So these things are supposed to cycle for 10 minutes on, 10 minutes off. But what you'll often see in fruiting room scenarios using an aeromist system is you burn the compressor out because you're not able to cycle it uh, to the minimum. So you'll have like 10 minutes on and uh, like two minutes off. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people who get these aeromist systems will actually have all the heads in the room. They'll have like, I think there's like fucking 16 heads and they'll be dousing the shit out of their fucking mushroom blocks and mm -hmm. creating crazy amounts of uh, water that just don't need to be there. So there's ways to get around that. Some people love aeromist systems. Some people hate them. I don't really have an opinion, but I've, I've definitely seen them not work in a lot of areas. Um, so the best system that I've seen that places like New Hampshire Mushroom Company use, Mousin Valley Mushrooms, uh, Far West Fungi, uh, places who figured it out um, are the heart environmental systems. So if you go to heartenv.com, you'll sort of see these systems at large. And what it is, is like a, it's this little mixing box that's like the size of a pack of cigarettes. And it has a one-way valve in it. <clears throat> and that one-way valve is operated by just like a 12-volt plug or whatever. And you have water coming in from one side. And you have air coming in from another side. And that air is coming from a compressor. Womp, womp, womp. <whistles> compressor. That compressed air and that water can be regulated. Say you want to regulate the flow of water with a ball valve. Um, you can. And you can finely tune this mix to the right atomization that you're after. So when your CO2 meter calls for, I'm sorry, when your, <laughs> when your humidification meter or hydrometer or whatever it is that you're using, wet bulb, dry bulb system, calls for humidity, this valve clicks open. And basically this pressure of air and water that's built up in this chamber from your compressor and your pressurized water line um, blasts off into this head, fully atomizing at the top corner of your fruiting room to disperse a nice dry fog over your actual fruits. For like a 12 by 24 room, you're talking one or two of these. I think they're like 300 bucks. Everything's 300 bucks today in my brain. <laughs> The smallest compressor you need, a, a nice rotary compressor is great, but per unit, I think you need like one of the larger Lowe's, $400, is it like four or 500 bucks? 300. 300. It's another 300 <laughs> unit? Oh, it's 300 bucks. Hey, you're gonna spend my, you $900 wanna, so far. And you you wanna buy my canoe? <laughs> yeah. How, how much? 300 bucks. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All that being said, I think that the, uh, system that heart emg uh put together is specifically for like produce for uh humidification applications in factories and so on and so forth it's really efficient it's really great and yeah it does require a larger compressor to run but you don't have to worry about anything in regards to like your humidification setup other than like taking this little like nozzle off which comes in two different micron sizes for atomization and soaking it in some vinegar putting another one on there that way, if it gets clogged up at all, you know, you, you don't have to deal with it. You can filter the air. Most compressors have an air filter, which is great. And then you can simultaneously on the H2O line. You memorize this drawing so far? I hope so, because it's gone. <laughs> it's so satisfying. You can throw a peristaltic pump into this. So what's really interesting about these sort of like high pressure systems is just the fact that they have two inputs. So say your water input is coming through over here, a peristaltic pump in line basically creates through a motorized function, a X amount dosing system of um, let's call it CLO2 or bleach, doesn't really matter. 
um, diluted bleach, whatever. There's very complicated uh, dosing systems out there. But once again, these are like an Amazon special. They're like 50 bucks, which is great. Um, you just put a vat of it <clears throat> in line, splice it into your water lines, and it essentially allows you to dose your water going in to keep it clean. Um, you can even have a water softener here if you really want to extend the life of these. But these boxes, I think the longest ones have been running between eight and 10 years. And uh, your investment there like ensures that you don't deal with a lot of systems, uh, system errors like uh, contamination, but also like failures from aeromist system, compressors blowing up or whatever. Um, have you ever seen a compressor light on fire? <laughs> <laughs> Were you here the day one lit up on fire? Yeah. <laughs> That was awesome. Uh, you want to, one thing you didn't get into too much detail about is just the, you know, the degree of atomization and, and the benefits of high pressure. Just, you know, yeah. like what type of fog do you want to make ideally? Yeah. I mean, this speaks to like the, um, once again, we have a side version of your room. And if you have ultrasonic going into a room like this, you're going to create like a pool of water you always have to get rid of. And the atomization sort of rate using water and uh, and uh, air pressure allow you to get, I forget what the micron size is that you're after. Um, but for instance, I think it's like, it's like 0.03 or something like those nozzle heads. So like mm. it's tiny. So if you put your like, you know, great little turkey man hand in, in front of that fog and you're like, hey. Uh, essentially it's a dry fog. So you can put your hand in front of it and it'll get moist, you know? Damn, my hands are really dirty. I should, should put them in front of a high pressure fogger. Oh wait, we don't fruit mushrooms. Um, you're essentially like getting this really like finely atomized mist that can in line with your sort of airflow system really create this like dense fog and then it goes away and then a dense fog, and then it goes away. And what you're trying to do with this is create a swing that goes from about 70% um, inside of your fruiting room to about, let's call it 90%. And that swing back and forth is adjusted based on a humidification controller. Um, there's a couple different ones out there. A lot of people will tie uh, temperature and humidity into the same controller system. Um, there's a company in Italy that creates one. It's, uh, I forget the name of it, but we'll pop it mm. up. Pop it up. Um, um, right here, right above. And what's the logic of doing that? This swing? Yeah. So essentially when you're fruiting a mushroom, <clears throat> man, now we're getting into the complicated fruiting side. This is like a bonus condition of this episode you have this block that looks all too square and you have mushrooms fruiting all over it right so these mushrooms that are fruiting all over your block are essentially um they're pulling moisture from the block which is about 62 percent hydration so the total moisture content of this block is allowing the mushroom formations to pull all of its sort of um, nutrients, but as well as water to form these sort of, you know, funny uh, shapes of water. Growths. Yeah, into that. Right, right, right. Yeah, mm -hmm. so this is a good point. This is a good time to say that, like, if you're a mushroom farmer, you just grow funny shapes of water. That's it. If you don't grow them well, you can't sell them for shit, man. So when you have a humidification system, that allows for a swing of 70 to 90%, um, you know, respectively. This could be slightly lower, this could be slightly higher. Mm -hmm. You can do that with a really good, finely atomized humidification system that causes evaporation. And what you'll see in a lot of fruiting rooms is the fact that you're selling, you know, funny shapes of water. These mushrooms will get soaked in water and sort of precipitate issues from blotch to other weird contaminations that really don't need to be there in the first place. And it's something that you're trying to do is you're trying to create this like healthy little happy bubble around your blocks that just protects them as they grow into the earth. And you can feel that. You can, you can be like, <sighs> yeah, it's right there. When you're on vacation, especially. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, let me check into the farm real quick. Mm. Are you there with me? Oh, shit. I left. Oh, shit. He left. All right. Yeah, he's on vacation. So, <laughs> yeah, 
if you have a system that's humidifying something to a degree at which it's just preserving the actual development of these mushrooms that are pulling all of its moisture from the goddamn block of fucking substrate, then you know that you're not soaking the shit out of your room. And you're not creating like just a, a swamp of chaos. Yeah, it's and it's important to point out too that this is just mimicking what happens. Mushrooms growing out in the wild world. There yeah. in, in any climate, there's gonna be obviously oscillations, high points and low points throughout a day of all these variables we're talking about. And you're just you're just creating that and you're controlling that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um does that answer your question? Oh yes, it does. Oh, Thank you. Jesus. We're so fucking... When, when will we stop being polite to one another? All right, all right. All right so AC, uh, what's it all about? So AC systems, generally speaking, have two functions in the HVAC world. They heat and or they cool. So when you have a fruiting room that demands a temperature like 55 to 65 degrees, what you end up running into a lot of the time is the fact that you can't get your temperatures down enough. So cooling, despite where you are, Canada, fucking mm -hmm. El Paso, cooling is like paramount. If you're starting a farm in El Paso, good fucking luck. Just kidding, your energy bill will be great. Um, there's two predominant mechanical ways to go about cooling. Heating, it's a little bit different. And, uh, and I think that while it can be said that both things are important to have in a fruiting scenario, you have two major options for control and you really have to, you know, allow your climate to depend upon which one you choose to go down. Imagine a walk-in cooler. We've all been in them. Some of us have had sex in them. Is that you? Was that you? That might have been that us. I don't remember. Oh, did we? No. Oh, okay. No. no. We don't talk about that um so inside of a walk-in container you'll usually see these uh you know like giant fans that are suspended from a wall and they have some weird tubular action going up and then usually outside or above the walk-in cooler you'll see a compressor this compressor or condenser or whatever you want to call it compression creates compression for coolant that gets flown through the back of these fans in a radiator that basically creates such a hyper chill that you're able to get your temperatures down to a degree at which you can keep fresh vegetables, you know, at like 33 to 36 Fahrenheit. I think we should do everything in Celsius just to make everybody <laughs> mad. <laughs> we are liking mayonnaise in the Belgium. Um, or you can get these systems to be charged to the degree at which they're actually getting, you know, uh, below freezing to, you know, say zero Fahrenheit. You're just trying to figure out, uh, what you're trying to do with those functions. So this allows you to get the temps down there. So say you want to use this system for a fruiting room in El Paso. It's your best bet to create a plenum that has a cooling system that it mimics this, um, um, and you can, you know, basically then maintain a 55 to 65 degree temperential differential using these units far easily than like a traditional HVAC system or even a heat pump. Um, creating a 55 to 65 degree air with this is best uh, um, accomplished using a heat craft system. And heat craft is the company that produces these evaporative coolers and condenser compressors. And I highly suggest them. They've got great uh, components and parts and do not sponsor this podcast in the least, fuckers. <laughs> and then you've got heat pumps. So let's say you live in uh, you live in rural Maine. And yeah, we got a yeah. few who like fucking, hey, fuck Maine, dude. We've got a couple uh, like zero degree weeks. So it gets chilly, you know. Um, but it's not Alaska. We don't really need to, like, you know, throw some high fucking heaters in here that off-put CO2. I'll come back to that. Um, heat pump units can be a great way to sort of deal with that. And what they are is essentially a heating cooling head and then a unit on the outside, which is essentially either cooling or heating. So you set the temperature on either of the units that you put in your room. Some people choose to put more for redundancy. Redundancy is the name of the game. Let's spell it now. Redundancy. Maybe she can do that. M A Y. Oh. 
No. It's spelled Doom. Redundancy Doom. It's pronounced Doom. I, once again, I'm like, am I spelling it? Redundancy? Redundancy. It's uh, redundancy. Okay. If you have two and one fails, you got another motherfucker. So, <laughs> these heat pump units essentially allow you to heat and cool this air and, you know, uh, deal with a variety of temperate climates. Um, and it might really help to have some scarecrow uh, examples of how air goes into your plenum. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So those are anything from Halcyon units to Mitsubishi makes them. Like there's a million different companies making heat pumps now. Um, generally speaking, like for two, let's say, because we built a farm like this, uh, you have a two 12 by 24 foot rooms next to one another and a plenum that's about 24 by 24. Uh, so almost the same size. You would use two of these units for redundancy, and you'd need about 3.5 tons of cooling uh, capacity. And tonnage versus BTUs, there's a lot of different language in here, and we'll go into that in a different episode. But mm -hmm. generally, heating and cooling can be achieved with this. Um, and then if you're in El Paso, like some poor son of a bitch. I don't know. Are there any farms in El Paso? I'm well, trying to speak Probably. <laughs> I can't think of one that we talked to. Yeah, I don't yeah. know any other. So redundancy is doom. Doom is three and a half tons. Three and a half tons will feed two by twelve by twenty four foot rooms, and uh, that's probably your best bet for climates such as that. Whereas if you really are in the goddamn desert, just get evaporative coolers for fuck's sake, and go to Heatcraft. Mm. Yeah. What okay. Else that's area. That's AC systems. Yeah. Controllers. <laughs> How many of them? Hmm. What are they all about? I love your deadpan questions. You're like a true fucking grade school teacher. What's hmm. it all about? Sex. What's it all about? Uh, <laughs> thermometers and thermostats essentially function in the same fucking way. Temperature is the easiest to control. Most of the systems involved will have their own controls for actually regulating temperature inside of a fruiting room. And an HVAC person can really get into this with you. And they can go overboard when designing your actual system. So be careful when sort of dealing with uh, HVAC professionals. Um, they don't always think outside the box of temperature. But at the same time, they also can't really comprehend why you're not recirculating air inside of a fruiting room. Right, right. And it's never going to help to say one cap of mushrooms produces a million spores yeah refer back to whatever episode on the Michael wizards podcast that was where you, oh, yeah. you talk about that story designing the yeah uh, i don't know substrate who knock room yeah. yeah 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 oh man who was with that i can't Couldn't uh, tell you uh, 24 hour brain um so temperature controllers are pretty easy you can call for a temperature humidistat inside of your fruit room um, if generally speaking, you have to, uh, you know, create any active air exchange based on temperature and you can have a fan that actually controls the exhaust in a separate way. So say you have your plenum of air and you have your fruit room. So this is your fruit room. And this is your plenum. You can have a damper and an active, almost positive pressurized system it's a fan right here that kicks on as soon as your temperature module says hey we need we need cooler temps in here we need warmer temps in here and what will happen is this positive pressurized sort of uh, action will allow uh, the dirty air but also the warmer cooler air in here that you're trying to change to go outside of the fruiting room the other way to really do that is to take a negative pressurized system and have it operate in the same way so you have another second exhaust that just controls temperature. And this doesn't have to be as severe as CO2. Temperature is a little bit more easy to regulate. So let's say you're in like the 500 CFM range and you have a duct with a damper on it so it doesn't backflow. But this calls for temperature and it kicks on a thermostat for your negative pressurized system. Once again, a redundant one. This is your 1000 CFM. And it pulls with a CO2 meter. Then you can allow your fruiting room to operate with temperatures and operate with uh, CO2 at the same time. In doing that, it's got a number of different like effects and you could share an intake duct and you could have them sort of mechanically or, or automatically.
automatically operated or just have the pressure actually build up a damper so that, you know, as air is moving into the room, then creating negative pressure, it's pulling and therefore it opens the damper. Or you could create a positive and negative system. There's an advantage to both of those, but generally speaking, having two negatives is your best way to go about this. Um, you can also have a fan that controls CO2 and it controls temperature. So if you just wanted a one-way system, this could actually be controlled by a thermostat and it could be controlled by a CO2 system. It's a little bit complicated in terms of wiring, but generally speaking, if you're doing this yourself, just put two fans in there. Once mm -hmm. again, mm -hmm. this is spelled redundancy. Dance, dance, dance revolution. Dance, dance, dance revolution. And so... Easier to wire, easier to line up, yes. redundant, and gives you a easier degree of controlling each independently. Yeah, exactly. There's other ways to go into that um, complex setup of fans and controllers, but keeping it simple for a first fruiting room is sort of integral. <clears throat> and we can definitely go into some serious like examples of designs down the road in this podcast, video, vlog. What is this? What do they call these things? Vlogging. Oh, we're vlogging, bro. Uh, so the other control that's necessary in these fruiting rooms is going to be uh, a humidity um, controller. And we already went into the CO2 controller. Um, there is a company and uh, there's, you know, there's a couple out there that sort of um, have different systems for controlling humidity inside of a room. Um, some of them have digital sensors. Inkbird is a, uh, you know, one that will fail after like a couple months and mm -hmm, you'll have to get mm -hmm. another. But humidity is funny. Like depending upon how you're going to operate, the best system is the oldest system and it's a wet, wet bulb, dry bulb system. And uh, I'm not going to go crazy into it, but it's basically a way of saying this is what an accurate humidity uh, temp setup is. This is what it is inside the room. It does some quick math using a computer and allows you to actually regulate and auto uh, automatically control the humidity going into the actual fruiting room. So we'll go into like a bunch of these different designs and, and we'll start to get them here and make fun of them. And test Yeah, them. well, and this specifically too is something that's like info that's easily accessible yeah. online. Yeah, there's so many different things. What a lot of farms will do, especially if they're not about to impress them, their spouse or their fellow farmers with a high pressurized system is they'll just get a cycle timer and they're using right. usually cycle timers uh, with their, you know, ultrasonic, you know, humidification setup. So let's say you've got one of those fancy ass fucking, you know, hydrofoggers sitting outside of your room, of course, and you want to be able to properly atomize the right amount of humidity into the space. But what happens is the wintertime it gets drier and the summertime it gets, you know, more humid um, and you can't accurately rely on a controller you can't afford or access or your ink bird died or whatever. You can use what's called a cycle timer. And a lot of people don't really know these exist. They do require a far more, you know, like attention uh, to detail per se. You have to be in the fruit rooms, you know, all the time to make sure that they're operating. But what they do is they have an off and an on setting. So you can set this for like uh, 10 minutes on and uh, 20 seconds off. And that's on your driest season and you only have one hydrofogger left and your other one's down. Mm -hmm. and you're like, fuck. Mm -hmm. So this just basically plugs into this system and you regulate the on and off controls, which will fire this up and then kill it. Fire it up and then kill it. And you can regulate this from seconds down to minutes and hours, I believe. And these are called, one more time, cycle timers. Whirp. Does that cover Right on. Yep, I, I think, think that, that was, was pretty thorough. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this will come up again. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Um, the last sort of control that you really need to think about, and we'll go into a little bit, is lighting. Uh, but that's just general electric for your like you know fruiting rooms in general. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, um, sizing room carts and yields. Okay, so now you're getting into the nitty gritty. It gets a little bit more nuanced. It does. So maybe we should save that for a different podcast because we can yeah. draw it out. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. We have that whole episode concept of 
density and as it pertains to metabolism and yeah co2 and such yeah we'll get we'll get further into it but i think that generally speaking um the pdfs that we'll add to this episode have very specific layouts for like number of carts number of blocks blah 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 something to mention for fruiting rooms in general is um rolling racks are you know the most important tool um when you have a fruiting environment you have so heavy of a spore load that eventually Mm -hmm. we all get spore lung and uh our lives suck because of it. So, <laughs> so I think what we're trying to establish in farms that are growing, and I've definitely instilled like the fear of God in some farms. Oh, is sure. like wear a respirator. I see or a lot more respirators outside. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, these things are. It's no joke, man. If it's gonna break a fucking AC system, it's gonna break a biology system mm-hmm. pretty fast. So, either wear a respirator um, or have mobile shelves, and that just allows you to have your fruiting room and have your, it doesn't have to be your plenum, but say it's an area where you harvest grade and pack. It just allows you to roll carts out to harvest and throw them back in once you're full up of blocks. And it really just gives you some, you know, accessibility. You can really control spore load by, you know, when you harvest. Right. That's a huge factor. Don't let your mushrooms get overblown. Their shelf life goes down. Spore load goes up. Shit gets complicated. Yeah, yeah. If you're going for quality, and if you're trying to minimize that spore load, you can dial this stuff in. It's it's hard when you have a million crops going at the same time, but yeah, you know, at the right scale, at the right level of attention to detail, yeah, you can minimize that spore load. Yeah, it's totally true. Also, phenotype selection has yeah. something to do with that for sure. Yeah, it does. It does. Yeah, there's there's this like uh, mythological sporeless oyster that everybody talks about. Mm, yeah, a lot of those big industrial spawn companies they're are breeding yeah. those. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 smart. We are in the the biotech world when it comes down to food production. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we'll drill into some of that uh, at a later date as it pertains to not only fruiting but other aspects of the whole cycle. Yeah. Last thing you got here is lighting, Eric. Well, Tyler, if you ask the Chinese or the Japanese, warm light versus cool light are the Mm. spectrums. Warm Mm -hmm. light becomes Mm -hmm. the light in which you want to incubate blocks in, and cool light is the light in which you want to fruit blocks in. And there's a lot of different reasons for that, and there's a lot of different experiments and tests that have been done and made, but essentially you're trying to mimic seasons at this point. And this gets <clears throat> as complicated or crazy or in depth as um, uh, trying to alter the color, the size, the um, taste, texture, and the actual uh, speed at which something fruits mm-hmm. um, or doesn't fruit. So, cool light um, and all spectrum light become like an important factor for fruiting rooms. They're the easiest one to have uh in terms of finding them at your you know local store or whatever and so long as you have enough light that your mushrooms can see and you can see and it's pretty predominantly bright in this room not like grow light bright but you just want 6500 calvin lights 6500k is an all spectrum light Mm -hmm. it's a kind of bluish light you know it's not as warm um but it will actually give you an accurate representation of like you know the color of the mushroom and yeah, it's like daylight, essentially. Um, so that's the best way to do it. <clears throat> More lights become important are for certain species that require it. I know you had an example of that. Yeah, there's, you know, uh, there's a lot of varieties where it's not the most important consideration to get them to grow well and to grow at all. But there's certain varieties that are pretty heavily light triggered, yeah. um, both in terms of where they're going to fruit and how much they're going to fruit. Yeah. Um, and we'll get into specific species uh, in their own episodes as we move month by month through this. But, you know, just some that come to mind would be Kings, King Oyster. That's a big one. Um, uh, their, their Mediterranean cousin, the Nebradini, um, Beach or Shimiji, Shimiji. Um, what else we got that's super light triggered? Chestnuts kind of? A little Not bit, a really little bit of lion's bit. mane. Um, yeah some extent but those are two that come to mind where at that point the lighting regime becomes a lot more specified yeah Um, and like mushrooms in general are phototropic 
unlike uh, agaricus mushrooms, uh, most of these saprophytic basidium mycetes are they're phototropic. They they need light. It's a pinning trigger, but it's also a developmental trigger. Um, you know, without getting crazy down a timeline of like mycology and biology, like we didn't separate too far uh, from mushrooms, you know, that long ago. Mm -hmm. And we need light. Vitamin D is important. Obviously, sunshine for humanity <laughs> in general and well being and COVID. Right? Yeah, despite oh, despite our sedentary ways these days. Right. Yeah. So mushrooms in particular do need uh, a fair amount of light to be able to i don't know grow accurately yeah and there's you know the uh, the triggers to get a mushroom to fruit are yeah. multifaceted so all these species are going to be to some extent or another stimulated by uh temperature differentials uh lighting differentials and so on but with one species lighting will be a lot more important than than another yeah, yeah. for sure yeah i wish we I could be like hey any questions anybody got any questions but then we'd be here all fucking day right right and uh as we say in our intro we will be taking questions and we will be giving answers yeah that's very true that's very true so i think we're uh we're sort of at this stopping point with what has quickly been our first recording episode of uh, how to properly construct a fruit crown. Please like? direct all your feedback to our human resources specialist, Edna Krabappel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We kicked She'll get back to you know. Monday to Friday, 8 to 4, <clears throat> except for bankers' holidays. Yeah. And I think the next one. We're going to cover uh, lab design, clean room design, all the X's and O's of that. He knows more and that's where I'll be talking. It's true. That's I talked a lot. I need to go get high now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hit us up. I think our, we have an email. I never even looked at it, but Michael Wizards at Michael Wizards at com. Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. Cool. So if you have questions, concerns, comments, hate mail, you can also just send us letters. Those are cool. I'm really into letters, as most people know. Um, yeah. All right. That wasn't so bad. That was good. That was good. I like it, dude. Success! Success!